We're here at CES 2018, and whilst at the Dolby booth, we took the opportunity to talk to Mahesh Balakrishnan about the latest developments in Dolby Atmos. So one of the things that we're doing with Dolby Atmos is really trying to make it more accessible to consumers and making it mainstream. And that means for us two things. One is making it available to consumers in a different kind of form factors on a playback device and different price points. So when Atmos first came to the home, it was available in AVRs and with discrete speakers. And now we're making it available on TVs with our partners, with soundbars, uh, our partners such as LG and Sony that have announced soundbars at uh, CES this week, uh, are making it available in multiple SKUs, some soundbars that are just just a soundbar plus a subwoofer, a second that's a soundbar, subwoofer and wireless uh, uh, surrounds. Um, the lowest price point that uh, has been communicated in press releases is under $600. When soundbars first came to market with Dolby Atmos, they were at about $1,000, So now, in about a year and a half, the price has gone down by 50% for the lowest price soundbar. Um, the second thing that we're doing is on the content side and working with content in, uh, creatives to get Atmos content created across a wide variety of genres. Not just movies, but episodic television shows, uh, sports, games, music, uh, the whole gamut. You mentioned the soundbars. Um, in a cinema, there are a lot of speakers involved with delivering Dolby Atmos. Can, can a soundbar really deliver a, a believable Dolby Atmos experience? Right. We believe it can. And the way we look at Dolby Atmos is that we do not consider Dolby Atmos as one absolute performance level, but that in every product category, Dolby Atmos makes that product category provide a better experience. And really, this gives consumers a choice as to what kind of setup they want. There are some consumers that will want an AVR with multiple speakers. There'll be other consumers that want a soundbar. There'll be some that want just a TV. And this essentially gives consumers a choice as to what works for them. Uh, we have examples where uh, people have AVRs with discrete speakers in one part of their home and in a different part of their home they have a TV that has Atmos built into it. Um, they've begun using Dolby Atmos in live broadcasting in the UK for the English Premier League. Right. What do you think Dolby Atmos adds to a sporting experience? Sure. So the main thing that it does to a sporting event is that it actually makes you feel like you're actually in the stadium. So as an example, in the English Premier League games that have been broadcast, one of the things that the sound mixers have done with sound is that they've taken the PA system and actually put it above your head. So when you're watching a, a soccer match on TV, you hear the PA system over your head that makes you feel like you're actually in the stadium and you're watching the show watching the soccer match in, in real life. Um, how easy is it to actually mix in Dolby Atmos during a live event? Yeah. So the way it's done is that it's actually fairly simple because as you can imagine in a live event you do not want an extremely complex workflow. So what we've done is worked with the, uh, with the sound mixers. They usually set up an Atmos mix ahead of time and then they don't touch it too much while the game is actually going on. The other good thing about live Atmos mixing is that once you have uh, learned how to do it once, it's fairly easy to do it multiple times. So in the case of movies, five years after Atmos was first applied to movies, we are now at about 850 movies done in Dolby Atmos. But six months after having uh, the English Premier League done, we have more than 250 uh, soccer matches that have been done in Dolby Atmos. So the volume of content in live sports is going to scale much faster than it is in movies. Along with movies and episodic TV and live sports, you've also been using it with music. Right. And what benefits does it add there? So in the case of music, uh, what we're finding is that the, uh, the musicians and the creatives that mix music have been really uh, excited about what they can do with Dolby Atmos. Uh, Atmos allows you to create a much wider sound stage. It allows you, for instance, in a musical piece to separate physically the musical instruments so that you can have one instrument coming from here, a second from there, and it creates a, a, a richness uh, in music that they haven't been able to do with, without Atmos. With Blu-rays and Ultra HD Blu-rays, some movies have Dolby Atmos soundtracks and some don't. Who decides which disc has a soundtrack and which doesn't? That's mainly the uh, decision that is taken by a studio, and there are a few factors that come into it. First, the movie has to be done in Dolby Atmos for theatrical release, and then it's a separate decision from a studio as to whether that particular movie is going to be in Atmos for home distribution. Uh, in some cases, uh, a slightly different mix is created for, uh, for home distribution because you create what is called a near-field mix, and studios decide whether they want to do that and have it distributed. So it's a decision that's really taken by the studio. And um, what do you think the future holds for Dolby Atmos? So the future is really getting uh, Dolby Atmos to form, uh, devices with different kinds of form factors, uh, making it available at lower price points that make it available for consumers depending on whatever setup they, they want, continuing to work with the content creative industry, they have Atmos applied in the content forms where they want to apply it, and just increasing the volume of content and increasing the number of consumers that have access to that, uh, to that experience. And that's the thing that we're focused on to make sure that uh, millions if not billions of consumers around the world have Dolby Atmos experience on a regular basis.
Mahesh, thank you very much. Thank you.